right, people? Let's talk about glazing. So that's going to be the next step in the process. Uh, but before we get to that, we need to go over the color, right? Because um, you probably want to know what colors I'm dealing with so you can replicate this yourself or at least um, you know, know what color mixtures I'm dealing with here. So first thing we're going to do is we're going to take a look at my palette um, and discuss what each one of these paints are. Let's take a look at these colors. Uh, what we have here is, is a, a fairly typical cadmium centric palette. First color we have is cadmium lemon, cadmium yellow medium, uh, we do have a little bit of a wild card in here that's Indian yellow, cadmium orange, and this is peril orange, uh, which you see has, has that nice um, deep uh, orange color, cadmium red medium, this is quinacridone rose, and that's I used to use alizarin crimson permanent in here, but I ended up opting for uh, the purer version of it, which is quinacridone. Um, alizarin permanent is quinacridone, usually quinacridone mixed with um, a phthalo green or an, uh, an ultramarine blue or something like that. So um, I have quinacridone rose there, uh, viridian green. This is phthalo blue, which doesn't get a whole lot of use, but, but when you need it, you need it. Cobalt blue, ultramarine blue. This is transparent yellow iron oxide, which is, which is really close to yellow ochre. Um, this is transparent red iron oxide, which is also quite close to burnt sienna. And I use both of these, these colors here instead of the ochre and sienna because they glaze a bit nicer and they have a bit richer color, which I prefer. Uh, this is the burnt sienna again. We have cobalt violet light and cobalt violet. Then we have ivory black and the good old lead white. Um, and one of the things that you, that you should be aware of in the colors that you're using is the oil content in them. Well, part of what's nice about the cadmiums is that they are low in their oil content. Um, so you can use those in the earlier versions of the painting and you can use them you know, in fairly large proportion and still be okay uh, thinking about fat over lean. Now other colors like the quinacridone, the peril, um, viridian, the blues, stuff like that, you don't want to use a ton of those colors in the initial layers of the painting because those have a very high oil content to them. And you, you know, want to save your more oily paints for later on in the painting. Now if you're using them in smaller proportion at the beginning, then you don't really have a whole lot to worry about there if you're using just little bits of them. Um, but then jumping up, so all of the blues are, are are really rich in color or really rich in um, oil content and then we get into the earth tones here and these are uh, low to kind of average um, oil content especially these iron oxides I think they have a little bit more oil in them than a normal burnt sienna and yellow ochre um, but I find that that increase of oil worth the the the, the wonderful color quality that's there um, and the last three colors here are also uh, very high in their oil content. And white, I think generally all whites are really low in their oil content. So good things to, to understand when you are working on layering your paint um, and layering your color so that, you, so that you leave your more oily paints for later on. All right. So now we begin glazing. And glazing is just a thin layer of paint. Uh, the reason glazing is such a uh, special and unique thing to oil paint is that oil paint has a really low refractive index, which means that it allows light to pass through it 
more successfully than any other painting material. Um, and what is so nice about a glaze is that a glaze will thin down the paint and allow more light to pass through the paint. And it really does allow light to bounce around inside of the painting. That's, that's really why there's so much glazing in paintings that you see in museums. Um, up until, you know, probably like around the Impressionist time in the 1870s, you had the, the vast majority of paintings being done with glazing. And that's really because the, the effects of light that glazing can replicate, the way that glazing can harness light because it is a thin layer of paint that allows the, the, the light to actually go inside of the painting and bounce around inside. Um, those are really, really desirable, at least were really desirable properties. And I'll explain what I'm doing in just a second here. Um, so, what happens with the glaze is that you have a thin layer of paint and the light will penetrate that thin layer of paint and every thin layer of paint until it reaches an opaque layer. And when it reaches that opaque layer, it will bounce off. So it, it passes in and then bounces back. And that's how you have light bouncing around inside of those glazed layers. Um, there are, you know, in history, many, you know, many paintings that had, you know, 10 or 20 layers of glaze on them. That is, you know, a bit on the higher end. But even three or four uh, successive layers of glaze will produce really luminous light effects. And... It's, it's a, a, a very beautiful and powerful thing to, to see in a painting. Um, it's also not something that's particularly easy to do, um, nor is it something that's done a whole lot uh, typically today. So what I have done so far is I've taken a bit of liquid on my palette and I have spread it around on the surface with a brush. You don't have to use a brush, you could put it on um, a rag or something like that. You could actually use the palm of your hand and use that to spread it around. You would want to make sure your hand is clean. Um, but really, ideally, you're just trying to put a thin layer of, of, of oil on the surface. I happen to be using liquid because I'm trying to speed the drying of this painting. Um, but you can do it with, with linseed, linseed oil or stand oil or something like that as well. Um, walnut oil, whatever kind of painting medium you want, and that will put a nice thin layer of oil on the surface, and it makes the surface wet, which is really different than working on top of a dry surface. So what I'm doing right now is I'm just kind of letting it sit for a minute or two uh, while I explain some of this stuff. But um, another thing you can, you can probably tell is that there is uh, a bit of distressing to the surface. So before I painted today, um, I, I gave this painting a couple days to dry, and then I, I lightly sanded the surface with some sandpaper. I think it was um, like 400 grit sandpaper. Um, not that that matters necessarily. You don't want to use like, you know, a really coarse sandpaper, but the sanding just takes a little bit of the oil off of the surface. It also makes the surface a little bit more matte instead of glossy, which is part of what taking oil off the surface does. And when you make the surface more matte, you are dealing with um, a surface that will accept paint better. So the paint will be more readily accepted on a matte surface than a glossy surface. So when you are putting on a layer of paint, even if it's not a layer of glaze, you want to make sure that that surface has a, a certain matte quality to it. You don't really want to paint on top of a really 
glossy surface because paint doesn't want to bind to a really glossy surface. So I did some, um, some sanding and you can see in the light areas here, I was also sanding, but because there is thicker opaque paint here, you don't see that paint being rubbed off. Whereas the super thin passages, you do see a lot more of that paint being rubbed off by the sandpaper. And that is very typical. I know that this is gonna go through many layers of paint, so I'm not concerned about this at all. Plus I like texture in my work anyway. So also doubly not concerned about what's going on here. So I put that liquid on, back into the process, I put the liquid on and then just wiped it off. And I wiped it off with uh, just, you know, my trusty old sock. And that is so that it's just a very, very thin layer of paint is on the surface. And now I will jump into some color mixing and start to get these glazes on here. So I'm seeing in this light, I really have a lot of kind of reddish tones. And just as a, a rule of thumb, the more you keep white out of your glazes, the richer your glaze colors are going to be. And not just white, really. The um, um, what am I looking for here? The opaque colors as well will make for less luminous glazes. Just getting a little bit of that kind of reddish color in here. You see, I'm just kind of scrubbing it around. This is, is not a stage where I need to be super, super careful about what I'm doing, especially in these light areas. These light areas, like I said before, are going to get a scumble, so these are going to transform significantly from where they are right now. But I'm trying to hit them with a bit of rich color and vibrancy just so they have a bit of that working at the very beginning because that initial color that I had is, is a much grayer type of color. That, that grisaille burnt umber is a much grayer color. So you can see a little bit happening right now, not a whole lot happening yet. That is to be pretty expected. I'm also, as you can see, kind of working the glaze into the surface here. And making sure it's, it's pretty nicely in there, it appears to be. I'm also working it just a bit larger than the shape I, I really want it in. Pushing it around a bit more so it's in, it's in just a bit more of an expansive um, expansive shape. So if I'm glazing the light area, I'm pushing it into the shadows a bit as well. Um, that just helps for a bit of, of overlap in the paint, a little bit of mixing, which is what you want. So I have that, that nice subtle little glaze right there. Now what I'm going to start doing is glazing these shadows and this is where stuff is going to start to transform a little bit more because this is where I'm going to start really changing the value more significantly. I'm actually going back to my burnt umber here. Hopefully you guys can see this this palette. And so there is kind of a, a reddish color to this. Starting off here. So with glazing, I always take a little bit of time to figure out my color. 
I, I go back and forth a decent amount at the beginning to make sure my color is just right because um, because the glaze is such a thin amount of paint it allows the color on the painting to show a lot and influence the color that you're putting on top influence that glaze so it takes me a minute to get the color I'm really going for I'm actually gonna Soften this even a bit more with a little bit more cobalt. I think I'm going to take just a touch of white here, which will give it a slight grayish quality. A little bit of that cadmium orange. So it would be using a little bit more opaque colors in here because I, I kind of want the that little bit of the extra impact that they're going to give this color. So the purpose of the glazing stage really is to start to infuse the painting with a lot more color um, and typically a lot more warmth. The, the glaze stage is, is really where a lot of that warmness happens because those are, are normally the most luminous colors in the painting. And then the scumbling stage, the next stage, is where you start to push the form a bit more and you start to cool the color down because you're working with more opaques. You're, you're working sort of inherently with some cooler type colors. So the scumbling stage is not going to be super thin the way that the glazing stage is. So part of what's, what's really nice about having the surface wet when you start the glaze, um, the reason I, I took the time to put down that liquid was because it, it really makes the glaze slide beautifully over the surface. Um, if you don't do that, it kind of the surface grabs it, the tooth of the surface really holds the glaze in place a lot more and it just doesn't spread around quite as quite as beautifully as as a surface that has um, you know that that layer of oil already down. Plus what's nice about having the oil down is you see that I'm not using any oil on my palette I am using just the oil that is on the surface I also only put the oil in the area that I was going to work in right now. Um, you don't want thin layers of oil drying um, without, without them being mixed with any paint. So I only put the oil down in areas where I'm going to work in this painting session. I think that's going to be just the face. And if I have time, I'll, I'll, you know, move around to another area, but I will first oil, you know, put some oil on that area so that the glaze, once again, will, will flow really nicely. And so I can get a little bit of form with glazing. Glazing is mostly darkening things, though. So... I don't want to go for all of my darkest darks yet. I want to save that for later because the glaze process 
will be a multi-stage process. I'm not, I don't plan on doing all of my glazing right now. I will also glaze later and that will give me the opportunity to, to darken things further in a really luminous way because I'll be putting more layers of glaze on top. This brush is too dirty for that, for what I was just about to do. So I'm going to get a new brush here. Um, but typically for me, the glazing layer is fairly rapidly done. It's the scumbling layer where I spend a lot more time. Um, and right now I'm still trying to get a feel for the whole thing too. This, eventually these stages will take longer. But right now I'm, I'm really just trying to get a bit more color happening here, get a, get a bit more luminosity happening here in this initial stage. Mostly just cadmium red there. A little bit going on in here. So I'm kind of take that and move it around a little bit. It's a little bit heavy application. Um, one of the one of the really nice things about a glaze too is that it's so delicate and it doesn't cover up a whole lot. And if you if you really don't like it in an area, you can get rid of it. You know, you can just literally wipe it right off. Um, so glazing is, is for me a really fun part of the process because I can kind of feel a little bit more at liberty to get a bit wonky with it, which I'm not necessarily doing right now in this demonstration, but, um, you know, I feel like I can, I can do a little bit more experimenting with color and with, with texture and application of the glaze because I know that it's so easily removed. Um, just makes me feel uh, a little bit, a little bit more excited to try some different things. So, Maybe, maybe you will feel that way too. So we're getting a little bit more some violets in here. I'm keeping my color mixtures fairly simple right now too. A lot of a lot of the complexity in in glazing color happens as you put multiple layers of it on the surface. All right, well, let's work for a little bit. continue here um, but you can see this this background color that I put in uh, on the palette is actually pretty green um, it was a mixture of green green gray um, it's a mixture of the yellow iron oxide cobalt blue 
and a bit of burnt umber, which does have a greenish type of color to it. Um, obviously a pretty neutral green, but you see how this kind of neutral green actually went on that warm brown. It's starting to even out the temperature of this a little bit, so it's not quite as hot anymore. It's starting to get a little bit cooler. I also threw it all in the hair, and you see that that's starting to cool it down a little bit too. Um, and I could have could have gone a little bit stronger with the greenish color in there, but I kind of want to want to wait for that moment. So I'm gonna I'm gonna save it for later. What well, what I'm about to do right now is I'm going to kind of push this glazing stage in a little bit of a different direction in the hair, because with the hair I want this really streaky quality that you get in the glazing stage when you're using this thinner type of paint. So right now I'm going to start to work the lights into this hair in, in kind of a subtle way in order to start to define those shapes a bit more and to get that streaky quality that is in the paint. I'm also going to start to define a little bit more of the edge of the hair over here just so that I start to understand the difference in the hair versus the background right now. So let's get to it. Paint this pretty directly, all this pattern that's in here, there's, there's mostly like a red and gray and green pattern in addition to the black that's in there. Um, and I'm going to really just focus on, on those colors, not worry much about value at all right now. The value I'll, I'll start to worry about a bit more um, in the next glazing stage, I think, where I'll be able to easily glaze in some of those values. Um, but for now, I'm mostly just going to be getting some of that color established at the beginning. So stay tuned. 
recap a little bit of what was going on here. Um, as you can see, I, I, you know, mostly stuck to just putting in pretty blocky solid shapes for each one of these colors. Um, the, the little bit of the underlying value structure that was there um, definitely helped in making this not look completely flat right now. But I'm not worried about this too much because, because I can easily glaze in some shadows here later. Uh, what I really wanted to address though uh, in this pattern shirt was the, uh, the grayer colors in here, um, which, you know, in my shirt is a pretty solid gray. There are definitely some, some values that get close to white. Um, obviously that's not happening in the shadow here, but um, I am using a decent amount of white in the glaze for, uh, for, these, for these areas. Um, the thing to keep in mind though is I'm kind of using the, the least amount of white that I possibly can. I'm mostly trying to use other colors and as I'm mixing this stuff on the palette, uh, what I'm mixing is really like a value shade or two darker um, than, than what I actually want the value to be here. So that's, that's just kind of, you know, part of thinning down that paint because it is still, even though it is opaque with the white, it is still going down pretty thinly. Um, not quite as a completely transparent glaze, but as something that is kind of milky and has this translucent quality to it. Um, this is definitely not opaque, even though I am using opaque, opaque color in there. Um, and that's, that's just because it's being thinned with the liquid and you can thin it with, you know, whatever kind of glazing medium you're working with. Um, but that is going to give uh, still this nice luminous quality to whites in your glazes um, if you need to use white. And in this particular case there, there wasn't really a whole a whole lot else I could have done here that wouldn't have just really really darkened that area um, and I didn't really want that to happen so I ended up opting for, for a little bit of white in there and you can see that the valley structure is starting to come along a little bit more because of that too. Um, I did also get a little bit more opaque in some of those greens that are in there and that was just to give a little bit more punch to the color just to push it just just a, a slight bit further but if you get really close to the painting um, which you guys obviously can't do but but as I get really close to the painting here I can see that there is still a decent amount of the underpainting showing through this is not fully opaque paint it is still once again kind of translucent color. Um, so that's it for this stage right here. This is a pretty rough stage right now. Um, the next stage is going to be the scumble and that is where I'm going to start building my surface again. I'm really going to start working a lot more in building the form and building the middle tones and the light tones. Um, in the scumble stage. I will also go back into these shadows a little bit partly just to kind of clean up the drawing a little and and start to build a bit a bit more roundness in this overall form. Um, and this next scumble stage is, is going to take a decent amount more time than this last glazing stage. Um, but there's going to be a lot of stuff happening in the next layer. So stay tuned.